Good morning, everybody. How are you doing today? Who tweets? Good. Uh, I expect to see your cell phones out. Here's my hashtag. I'm at C Green. Uh, and if there's something I don't like, something you want to uh, make fun of, challenge, talk about later, uh, start tweeting, and, and I promise to look at all those later, and we can, we can have an ongoing conversation. Uh, and here's my email. If you like anything or don't like anything I talk about today, feel free to, uh, to reach out to me. Uh, here's what we're going to talk about today. Uh, we're going to talk about uh, open educational resources, uh, open licensing, open access, open science, a little bit about open data. We'll get to all that in a moment. Of course, all of these slides uh, and the presentation will be under an open license, and you'll learn more about what that means, which means you don't have to take notes. You can all have a copy. But before I dive in, um, I first uh, need to say a few thank yous. So first is that Ohio State's been a very important part of my life. Uh, my wife, this is my wife, Leslie, uh, she went to the veterinary school here. Uh, I took a, a master's and PhD in the School of Communication, and uh, we were actually married when we were at Ohio State, which eventually led to, to this happening. Uh, and then uh, that led to this. And uh, Leslie and I didn't have family in Ohio. And uh, the McCains, Tom and Jan, took us in. Tom's here today. Tom was my uh, advisor. He was on my doctoral committee. And he was a professor in the School of Communication. And this, by the way, is the proper way to hold a new baby. This is not. <laughs> And so Nate, our first son, uh, grew up at the McCain's home. There was lots of gardening and music and, and plenty of sweets. And I'm here today because of uh, Dr. Tom McCain. My job description at Creative Commons is to ensure that everyone on the planet has access to a high quality, affordable education. Uh, I wrote that because Tom told me that I have a responsibility as an educator. He told me that my job uh, was to help uh, others learn and to use the tools of our time to make sure that they could. Tom had a phrase for his grad students. He called us young Turks, and he saddled us with the responsibility to change the world for the better. And Tom's here with us today. Tom, would you please stand up? There he is. <laughs> Thank you, Tom. So here's what Tom taught me. First, that Everybody in the world has a right to an education, and that an education is a good thing. We're all here at Ohio State, not because we want to be multimillionaires. If we wanted to do that, you want to go on and work somewhere else. We work in higher education because we have a fundamental belief that education helps people's lives, it helps their families, it's good for society, overall it's good for liberal democracies, it helps people contribute, and it helps them uh, and their families have a better economic uh, life. We believe all these things fundamentally. And all of you, your jobs at Ohio State are to help the faculty here and the students leverage the tools of the day, the technologies of the day, the legal tools of the day, the content of the day, and the new pedagogies to help everybody accomplish this dream. So before we jump into some of this open stuff, I want to talk very briefly about some of the global trends that we're seeing as we work in Creative Commons. One is that the demand for higher education is skyrocketing. So I'm not going to read this. I want you to read this. This, by the way, is the former uh, chancellor of the uh, Open University in England, also the president and CEO of the Commonwealth of Learning. His name's Sir John Daniel. And I ask you, what do you think the odds are that the world will build four major universities that serve 30,000 students each to open every week for the next 15 years? Is that going to happen in the state of Ohio? Probably not. Certainly not going to happen in Washington State, where I live. I can tell you, as I travel the world, there's only two or three countries that are making those kinds of investments, India, Brazil, and China. And they're not coming anywhere close to the growth rate. So if we're going to meet the global demand for higher education, we're going to have to have other systems that we use. There's going to have to be online learning. MOOCs are probably part of that. There has to be other ways for people to get in. Because if we don't think that way, there's literally today over 100 million people who are ready to go to higher education who don't have the opportunity to do so. Second trend is student debt continues to rise. So I'll stick with the United States for a minute. And the public perceived value of higher education is falling. So you all probably saw these headlines over the past couple of years. Uh, student debt passed $1 trillion in the United States. That's more than all of the credit card debt in the entire US. The average 
Student debt uh, coming out of a bachelor's degree is now north of $27,000 a year. So that's what your students are saddled with as they're, as they're coming out. So people have asked, is college worth it? Of course college is worth it. We've looked at the statistics. We know that it's a good investment. It's worth taking out that debt. But the public is asking this question, and so it drives the question back to us. What can we do to make college more affordable? We'll talk about some of those ideas today. Next big trend, and this is probably the single most important global trend as it relates to open educational resources, is the affordances of digital things. So you all know this and you educate faculty about this every single day, and that is when something is digital, we can store it for free, we can distribute it around the world for free, and we can make a million or a billion copies of that thing for free. Now we've been doing this for 10, 15 years in education. So you, who remembers the days of uh, Scantron sheets and we made Xerox copies and OCR? We don't do any of that garbage anymore, right? Everything we build today is born digital. The video we shoot, the audio we capture, the slides, books we build, everything is created digitally. And because of cloud computing, because of mass storage, because of the falling price of computers, we can do things like this. So here's just one example. If you took a, an average 250-page textbook, here are the different things you can do with it, but I want you to focus on the bottom number. That's how much it costs to copy that textbook by computer. So uh, how many students at Ohio State on this campus? What, 52,000? So somebody, somebody whip out their iPhone. Where's Anand? Anand. Multiply 52,000 times .00084 and then shout it out when you've got the number. Here's how much it costs to distribute, right? Same thing. Yeah, it's expensive to put it in the mail and ship it, but it's not that expensive. And then to distribute over the internet, okay? So the question is, what is it? $37. $37. Who has $37 in their pocket? We can buy every Ohio State student uh, a textbook tomorrow. Right? These are the economies of scale. So the question is, when copying, distribution, and storage of the core resources that we use at Ohio State University become free, what do we do with that? And so to give you an example of how we have not fundamentally been disrupted yet in higher education, let's look at other industries that have. Anybody subscribe to any of these services? Gosh, that's a lot of people. Right? So this is a pretty good deal, right? For about eight bucks a month, I can get access to way more movies and television than I could ever consume. Anybody subscribe to any of these music services? If you haven't checked these out, I, I do Spotify. It's about 10 bucks a month. I used to buy three, four CDs a month, spent 30, 40 bucks. Now I spend $10 a month, and I have access to 15 million songs. And I don't know about you, but 15 million songs is enough for me. I mean, when I, there's only so much music I can listen to when I'm flying from Seattle to Columbus, Ohio. And so here's the comparison, right? For $20 a month, you can kind of have access to all of the music on the planet, plus anything that's ever come out of Hollywood or television for 20 bucks a month, or you can lease one textbook for your class, and when you stop paying the 20 bucks a month for your textbook, what happens to your access? It goes away. Right? You own nothing. You're leasing. And so I ask you, which industries have been properly disrupted by digital technologies? Right? These are the, this is what we're talking about. So fourth big trend, and this has been going on now for over a decade, and that's open educational resources. So what happened is roughly 10, 12 years ago, educators around the world started to ask if we can, if we're building stuff digitally, if we can store, distribute, and make copies of those digital things for near zero cost. Not quite zero, but you saw what the costs are. So close to zero, we're going to call it zero. What can we do with that? So there was a big meeting in Cape Town called the Cape Town Declaration is what came out of it. If you haven't seen this, look it up on the web. First, first paragraph is, we are on the cusp of a global revolution in teaching and learning. Educators worldwide are developing a vast pool of educational resources on the internet, open and free for all to use. These educators are creating a world where each and every person on Earth can access and contribute to the sum of all human knowledge. UNESCO coined the term open educational resources. The United Nations has a set of human rights, which include very basic things like the right not to get shot, the right to have basic uh, shelter, the right to have food so you're not starving to death. I mean, we're talking about basic level rights. They have added the right to an education to that list. Why? And it's a fairly recent ad, by the way. They're doing it because of the tools of the day. They know that we can share with everybody on the planet at the marginal cost of zero. We're just not doing it yet. Just last year, uh, UNESCO had a big conference 
uh, debated and signed what's called the Paris, an OER, Paris OER Declaration. 195 nations around the world signed it, including the United States, moving us toward uh, open policies in OER. So I talked about the tech technological tools, uh, but that's not enough. So when I worked with Tom, I taught a class called Living in the Information Age, and we were more than happy to share our course with anybody in the world. We put it up online. We said to other educators, here's the course, here's all the files, take it, please run with it. And very few people did, because at the bottom of the screen, what did it say? All rights reserved, copyright, Ohio State University. And anybody who knows anything about copyright knows that if they took that course and modified it, translated it into a new language, uh, changed it around, made a derivative work, somehow changed that work, in fact, they could be violating Ohio State's copyright. Ohio State could sue them in a court of law, and they would lose. And so nobody touched this thing with a 10-foot pole. Now, we didn't know about Creative Commons at the time. It was just getting started. But Creative Commons is the solution to that problem. So we're a nonprofit organization. Uh, we don't charge anything for our free copyright licenses. We're, we're 10 years old, and we operate around the world. We actually have teams in 75 countries, including the United States. So Creative Commons was started for this reason. When you build something in any country in the world, you automatically have ownership to it. You have copyright, which is a good thing. You build something, your rights should be protected. This is true of the faculty at Ohio State as they're building content as well. Anybody know how something gets in the public domain? What has to happen first? You have to die, right? It's an unfortunate set of events. Then after you're dead, what has to happen? Not 60, 70, right? And if you're in Mexico, you gotta wait 100 years. So now you're really dead, right? And so the question was, I, I've got this great course at Ohio State and I wanna share on Tuesday. And 10 years ago, Tom and I said, we're happy to share, but we don't know how. And we don't have access to expensive lawyers who can write custom licenses so that we can share with people in Australia or with, with somebody in Bucharest, right? And so, and we don't want to die first and wait 70 years. There was nothing in between. Creative Commons is the in-between thing. Creative Commons says, keep your copyright. Don't give that to anybody. That's yours. And if you want to add an open license to it, so you're communicating with the rest of the world the rights and permissions that you want them to have, you can do that and have the best of both worlds. You keep your ownership, and you share under the terms and conditions that you want. These are the terms and conditions. All of our licenses require attribution, which means if they use my stuff, they have to give me credit. Sharealike says if you use my stuff and change it, you have to share your changes forward with the world. So Wikipedia, anybody heard of Wikipedia? All right. Wikipedia uses the attribution sharealike license on every Wikipedia article. So when you change an article on Wikipedia, you're saying, yes, I will share that forward. Non-commercial is what it sounds like. You can use my work for free, you can modify it, you can't sell it. You can't put it online and charge 20 bucks for it. No derivatives means you can't change it, right? So you gotta leave my work just as it is. When you mix and mash those different conditions, you get one of these six open copyright licenses. And when you lay those out like this, when I say most free to least free, I'm not talking about cost, because there is no cost to use these licenses. I'm talking about the degrees of freedom that you're communicating to other people. And in education, this is really important. Because if we're gonna share our course or our textbook or our video, somebody else might wanna change it, right? So I'll give an example later about we built a big, project, a big OER project in Washington State, and Brazil's community colleges are taking our works, and they're throwing out all the silly examples of Northwest salmon and bears and trees, and they're putting in Amazonian rainforest examples. And they're ripping, you know, it's not in English, it's all in Portuguese, right? And if you, let, if you put a permissive license on your work, other people, can do that. So public domain is obviously the most permissive. There's not even attribution required. And we have a tool that lets you put works in the public domain. But in education, we try to stay up toward the top of this list. The CC BY license means the only thing that's required is attribution. The next one down is uh, share alike. You get the idea. Our licenses are global. They work in every country in the world, which is cool, because you can share something at Ohio State, and somebody else around the world can pick it up. So you saw the great examples of what Ohio State's doing to put resources online, make them free, but don't fall into the same trap that Tom and I fell into 10 years ago, where you put it up and it says, this is free, but it's all rights reserved copyright, because nobody will use it. Because more and more people around the world are educated about what that means, and they don't want to get sued. And if your intention is to share, put an open license on the work so that people can actually use it. So lots of people use uh, Creative Commons licenses. We met, we met, there's this little project called Wikipedia. Um, everything on Wikipedia is openly licensed. Anybody ever used Flickr before? 
for images. So I'm sure none of your faculty ever just go on the web and grab an image and stick it in their PowerPoint, right, and violate somebody's copyright. It doesn't happen here at Ohio State, but I can tell you it does happen at other universities. Uh, what you might do is work with faculty to take them to Flickr and do their search, but then filter their search by Creative Commons licensed images. And I did a count just before I came here. There's now over 305 million Creative Commons licensed images up in Flickr. Any scientists in the room? Anybody uh, physics, right? So you know CERN, right? So CERN's doing cool stuff. They're figuring out how the universe works and they're smashing atoms together. Well, CERN said, gosh, this is important information. All the images, all the video, uh, we're putting that all under Creative Commons licenses, so we're gonna get that knowledge out quick. This is happening not just in education, but it's happening in music, it's happening in journalism and broadcast, it's happening in traditional publishing, both open access journals, but also textbook publishers. It's happening in the glam sector. So this is galleries, libraries, archives, and museums. So libraries are taking all their metadata and they're saying, here's everything about our catalog. Somebody go build a new app for that. Uh, this is a, a huge project in Europe called Europeana, where they're taking all their metadata, the digital images of their works, and they're putting it online. I was on the phone with the Smithsonian two weeks ago, and they said, we have 30 years of stuff in vaults that's not going to see daylight because we don't have enough museum space. And I said, why don't you go down there with high-res digital cameras and 3D scanners and put it all up on the web under an open license so that the public that owns all these resources can actually see it, get access to it, use it in Ohio State art courses, for example. Uh, all the user contributions on the White House are under Creative Commons attribution license. The list goes on and on and on. So we're in higher ed. There are literally uh, north of 650 universities, uh, I I'm sorry, 650 uh, free open courses uh, that are up right now if you go to the Open Course Courseware Consortium site. And some universities like MIT have gone completely open. So anybody heard of MIT Open Courseware? Right, so 10 years ago, MIT's president stood up and said, you know what? Content is not our strategic advantage. Content is infrastructure. It's really important, it's gotta be great, but it's not what makes MIT great. The reason people come to MIT or Ohio State or Stanford or take your pick is they come for the great faculty, they come for the programs, the student support services, the career mentoring, the living in a community with other students, the professional networks that develop. They don't come because of your Statistics 101 content, right? And MIT realized that, and hundreds of other universities have followed MIT's lead and are now opening up, actually putting a, a Creative Commons license on their works so that one university can take a course or a textbook or something else from another university and legally use reuse it, revise, and share it. This is also happening in uh, K-12 uh, all around the world. One of my favorite examples is our team in Poland uh, worked at the president's office because half the kids in Poland didn't have access to a textbook. They launched an OER project. Now they do. Right? Cost the whole country about $15 million, and e every kid now has a textbook. So there are hundreds of projects around the world. We don't have time to go into them. Uh, I am running a session this afternoon, so we can talk more if you want. I've thrown around this term, open educational resources. This is the Hewlett definition of OER, which most people use, and it's worth taking a moment to go through it. So it's anything we use, teaching, learning, research materials, in any medium. I've been talking about digital, but open can be print as well. So we have uh, teams in, in Africa where there isn't high-speed bandwidth or, or connectivity to every village. And we move OER as paper. We put out DVDs across the country. Anything to get the information, the knowledge out to the people who are using it. So it doesn't matter what format it is, it's the license that gives people the legal rights to use it. The content either has to be in the public domain or it has to be under an open license that permits two things. It's got to be free, so it's got to be no cost, and you've got to have the legal rights to repurpose the materials to meet your needs. If it doesn't have those two components, it's not an open educational resource. So we were talking about MOOCs a minute ago. Anybody heard of Coursera? Right, or edX, or Udacity, or any of these? So most of the MOOCs that are out there are free, but they're not open. Right, because if you go to a Coursera course, and let's say that any faculty in the room, faculty, put your hands up. I'm gonna pick on this guy in the front, what's your name? Oh, Gene. Gene, what do you teach? Photography. Okay, so Gene goes and he finds a photography course in Coursera, and Gene says, wow, this is really great. I don't want the whole course, but I want part of the course. And so Gene starts downloading the course, but guess what, it says, all rights reserved, copyright, University of Minnesota. Gene thinks, hey, I'm good, right? This is a free course. In fact, Gene's violating copyright law and could get sued, 
I mean, A, he's violating the terms of service on Coursera, which says he can't do that, but he's also violating the copyright of another university. Gene probably didn't know this. Gene thought, hey, it's online, it's free, like what's the problem, right? But, but there is a problem. And so most MOOCs are free, but they're not open. Some MOOCs that have an open license on them are open. And why does that matter? Because Gene would very much like to legally use that photography content he found up on the MOOC. So we're working with, uh, with MOOCs right now to say, look, when the University of Minnesota wants to openly license their course in Coursera so Gene can actually use it here at Ohio State, make that easy to do. So I want to distinguish, there's a, there's, this is really important, free versus open. Free is good. But free is just free. Open is better because free is open plus, I'm sorry, free, <laughs> free is no cost plus the legal rights to reuse the resource, revise, remix, and redistribute, and retain. So we referred to this as the four R's. Reusing it is I'm gonna take part of that Coursera course, I'm just gonna use it as it is. Revise is maybe I need to modify it somehow so that it's ready for Gene's course. Remix is I'm gonna take some of that and some of this and mash it, create something new. Redistribute is Gene's gonna share it out with the world, put it on his blog. And the retain is he's got the legal rights to keep a copy. Nobody's gonna come into his class and say, sorry Gene, three months is up, you haven't paid your license fee, we're gonna take it away from you now. Right? That doesn't make any sense. And yet that's the model that a lot of, uh, a lot of the commercial content is moving toward is that they take the rights away as soon as your lease is up. So other reasons why open is important. One is that other people can improve on your work. So we were talking about accessibility in terms of the tables that you've got in the rooms. Well, content needs to be accessible as well. In fact, you don't have a choice. Any accessibility experts in the room? No? Nope. Well, I guarantee you've got them here. <laughs> uh, what's the name of your group here? You've got a really great group. Somebody shout it out. Web Accessibility Center, yeah. It's one of the best in the country. And so, and the idea is you under the 508 federal guidelines must have the content accessible, but we never do a good enough job. And usually what we do with online learning is we retrofit it afterwards once we realize we've got somebody in our class that needs that. And that's not good enough. And so with open educational resources, other people can make your content more accessible than it is. Translation is huge. What if anybody have any students in their class that speak something other than English? Right? Or might you want to use something from another country here at Ohio State that's written in a different language, you want to translate it into English. If it's got an open license, you've got the legal rights to do that. These are probably the two most important things in higher education, though. If you're faculty or if you're working with faculty, what they need is the legal rights to customize content so it's exactly what they want for the class. So when, and I'll pick on Tom here for a minute, when I took courses from Tom, Tom would say, here are five books that you need to buy for my seminar. And then Tom, because it was all he could do, said, yeah, read these three chapters out of this one and one chapter out of here. And we're not gonna read the rest because the rest of it's not very good. But that was how he customized, right? Not the best deal for the students because the books were really expensive. And then when we sold them back to the bookstore, we got 10 cents on the dollar. But we thought, well, it's just part of the cost of going to higher education, right? With open educational resources, Tom could have said, Really all I want is this chapter, and I want this piece and this piece and this piece, and I can customize it and build just what I want for the students. Can't do that with all rights reserved content. You can with openly licensed content. And affordability. Anybody ever heard of a student complain about the high cost of textbooks? Right, so at Ohio State, the average cost of textbooks for your students is about $1,200 a year. Right, so that's a big number. Now, I know that that doesn't approach tuition, but if you get into community colleges, so if we were talking at, uh, at uh, Columbus Community College, uh, that's probably a third to 40% of the cost of going to college. And so uh, there are major efforts underway to reduce those costs. So this is not all peaches and cream, right? If this was easy, it would just be done. There are big challenges, and we'll, we'll uh, bang on some of these in a session later today, but a lot of faculty don't even know what o OER is, right? How many people didn't know about Creative Commons licensing before you came today? Right, so this is, this is a common thing. People, do, I mean, we're not all copyright experts, right? We were not IP lawyers by training. And so a lot of people don't know about this. They don't know that OER is out there. They don't know that universities and educators around the world have been sharing content for 10 years and they're these massive repositories of really great stuff. Um, not everybody trusts free. People, well, if it's free, it must be garbage, right? Because you get what you pay for. But in fact, let me just bounce out to a site here. If you come out to, say, OpenStax College, this is a project out of Rice University, these folks are spending upwards of three, dollars $400,000 per book, which is not chump change, uh, and they're building intro to sociology, intro to physics, biology, anatomy and physiology. Your general education courses that you had up on the screen, it's this list. 
All these books are under a Creative Commons attribution license. They are free. You can take them in one of five different digital versions. And because there's an open license on them, you can modify them and use them any way you want. So you could say to your students, here's the Ohio State University version of economics from OpenStax College, and our faculty have made it better. And good news, you don't have to pay for any textbook costs for this course. Right? How would students feel about that? My guess is they'd be happy. <laughs> so let's, let's uh, jump on textbooks for a minute. One of the big problems with, and it's not just textbooks, but it's any required instructional materials for the class. The stats are, and this was a Florida uh, study, a California study came out where the points are about 10% higher. 60 to 70% of students do not purchase textbooks for their course every single quarter or semester. And this is a, this is a national phenomenon. Why? Somebody shout it out. Why aren't the students buying textbooks? Too expensive. Why, not, why else? Right. Yeah, yeah, my professor assigned it. We didn't use it. I'm sick of that. Ten cents on the dollar when I sell it back. Or sometimes I can't even sell it back because the, you know, the publisher spun the version and put a DVD in it and changed the cover and called it a new version. And so now I can't sell it back. Or, but, but when you ask students, what they say is, it's just not worth it. I'm sick and tired of spending 175 bucks or whatever the number is for a textbook. And by the way, that's the, that's the uh, if you look at the top 50 textbooks sold in the Ohio State uh, bookstore, the average cost of the top 50 books for your highest enrolled courses is $175.46. Okay, and the students say, I'm just not going to do it. And so why is this problematic if students are showing up to Ohio State classes and they don't have the educational resources that the faculty has designed to be used in the class? Is that a problem? Yes. Right? That's a big problem. The faculty member went to a lot of trouble to design that class. The instructional designers in this room went to a lot of trouble to think about what educational resources were needed. And 60 to 70 percent of the students aren't buying it. Right? So this is a problem. So we ran this little project called Kaleidoscope. And the idea was, could we take existing open educational resources, could we put them into an educational setting so that every student had 100% of the educational resources they needed that were designed for the course on day one. Guess what happened? First, everybody saved a lot of money. We knew that was going to happen, right? Because we took the cost of textbooks to zero. So fine, right? Check that one off the list. Uh, students were super happy. That was great. What really happened, though, is that student success rates went up across the board. And they really went up in things like developmental math. So if you think about developmental math or developmental writing, when you come into that course, you're already bad at math. And now I've got to wait three weeks for my financial aid to check to come in. And now finally I can go buy the resources. And maybe I don't because 60% of the students don't buy them anyway. And now how am I going to do it developmental math if that's my trajectory? Right? No surprise that people get stuck in that loop and have to take it over and over. These students didn't have that problem. We said to them, here, it's free. Not only is it free, but it's up to date. And your faculty have put together the set of resources exactly what they want. So the arrows here I've put to show the dates. I don't know if you can see it, but this is March 22nd, 2014. So this was just, just came out in the Baltimore Sun. Uh, the University of Maryland system, new strategy. They're moving toward what they call textbook zero. So if you go to UMUC in a few years, you will pay no textbook costs. And the faculty at UMUC are saying, you know what? We are going to borrow OER from around the world, and we're going to contribute what we build as open educational resources, and we're going to have state-of-the-art curriculum, uh, and you don't have to buy any textbooks. This was a, an article in the Seattle Times, also March 21, 2014, just last Friday. Editorial in the Seattle Times, textbook prices, a barrier to higher ed, and they cite a lot of the projects that we've been working on. Um, colleague of mine at University of Minnesota, couldn't be here today, actually just got a Hewlett grant and he can come here and work with you and work with your faculty if you want. Uh, and uh, it'll be on the slides uh, and here's his information. But he's actually uh, really licked this, licked this at the University of Minnesota. So he has figured out what are the barriers, what conversations do you have with faculty, how do you go through that cultural change, how do you get them to share, how do you get them to use other people's open educational resources. So there's people out there uh, that can help. States and countries are starting to say, this is an interesting idea. So in California recently, they took $5 million of state funds, and they said, we're tired of expensive textbooks. We're going to have the 50 highest enrolled textbooks in the California 
uh, UC, Cal State, and community college system, they're all going to be CC BY. They're going to be under a Creative Commons attribution license, five million bucks. Faculty, you choose which books, you decide how they're built, we'll put them out to RFP and we're going to build them. And they started that. British Columbia saw that and said, that's a pretty good idea. And we're going to do the same thing. And Creative Commons said, cool. So California, you do those 50. British Columbia, don't do those 50 because they're going to be open and free. We don't want to be redundant. You do a different 20. So now we got 70. And now Saskatchewan, Alberta, Washington State, and Oregon, we got kind of this pan Pacific thing going on, are, are all meeting. And we're having our second uh, meeting coming up. And the idea is that if we all work together and put an open license on what we build, then we all benefit. So California doesn't have to pay for 250 textbooks, but that's what they're going to get. They paid for 50, right? So does Ohio State want to play in this is one of the questions. And you're most welcome. Even though you're not on the uh, Pacific Coast, we still invite you in. I worked before I was at Creative Commons for four years. Well, first I worked here. I used to work in the College of Pharmacy. And then I worked at the Ohio Learning Network with my friend Cheryl Hansen here. Uh, I worked at the state. Uh, and then I went to work for the community colleges in Washington State. And we decided that textbooks were too expensive. We decided that it was a waste of faculty time, that every faculty member in our system was prepping for tomorrow's course and not sharing with each other. We actually did an analysis and just asked questions like, how many preps are happening for Spanish 101 tomorrow? And the answer was 150. And we said, okay, so you know, are you all working together and sharing? No. Right? And we decided since all these people are being paid with state tax dollars, that probably wasn't the best use of public money. And so we said things like, and this is uh, another Ohio State professor came up with this, we need to get rid of not invented here about other people's content and move to proudly borrowed from there. So not invented here is if I didn't build it, it's crap, which of course is a silly thing to say. And proudly borrowed from there is my role in the 21st century as a faculty member is to take the very best content from wherever I might find it, the expertise from around the world, and other people in my professional network who can help my students learn. Right? And that might be that I take a little bit of that physics course from MIT and a little bit from University of Barcelona, and then I fill in the other 80% with my stuff. But I'm going to proudly borrow from there. And we also said content's not a strategic advantage, taking a page out of MIT's book, and we can't afford it. A third of our faculty time in the community colleges was spent, spent building content and prepping for courses, and nobody was sharing with anybody else. That was a third that they could have been mentoring. So you talked about putting money back to students. Our idea was how do we put time and money back to students? How do we focus on what really matters? What's the value add? So here was our highest enrolled course in the community colleges. It was English 101. Everybody took it, basic writing course. Right? We had 60,000 to go through it. We looked at the textbook cost. That's how much money we were spending in one system, just in Washington State, on one book every year. Okay, $10.5 million. So one thing you should do here at Ohio State, run the data. Ask your registrar's office to run the top 100 courses, how many enrollments do you have, and figure out how much the books cost for those courses, and multiply it out, and your jaw will drop. This is where our jaw dropped. And we said this is unacceptable. Anybody know where this money comes from? It's a third, a third, a third. Where's the first third? Shout it out. Financial aid from where? Federal. Where's, another, where's the other financial aid come from? Second third is from the state. What's the final third? Student's pocket, debt, right? Or cash, or they had to work an extra job, or you know, more often than not in community colleges, I can't take two classes, I can only afford one because you've got an expensive textbook in the class. Okay, so we went to the state legislature and we said, do you realize that you're spending $3.2 million right out of the state general funds every year for one textbook for one course? Did you realize that? Legislature said, oh no, that's awful, but what, should, what can we do? And we said, well, I don't know, maybe issue an RFP for a million bucks, get the smart faculty at Ohio State University to build wonderful open educational resources, give them an ongoing contract of $200,000 a year to keep that, that set of resources update so it's never out of date, and put a Creative Commons attribution license on it. Now your legislative ongoing spend for that is not $3.2 million, it's $200,000. And would that be a good deal for the state of Washington? And let's not just do that for one course, but let's do it for all courses. And we decided this was insane behavior, right? And I hope that you do your data run and decide that it's insane behavior, what your students are spending here for textbooks as well. So we built something called the Open Course Library. The legislature said, you're right, uh, let's change this. And so we built the entire general education curriculum as OER. 
So if you go to opencourselibrary.org, you'll find the highest enrolled 82 courses. Most of them have open textbooks in them. All of the content is open educational resources. 60, 70% of it came from elsewhere, right? It was proudly borrowed from there. And then we built the final 30, 40%, and our faculty know what their students need, and they shuffled the courses. Here's what's happening in K-12. We were talking about this at dinner a little bit last night. So this is my state. Your state's almost identical to this. So um, somebody last night said, uh, every 10 years, there's a levy that goes out, and that's when you can replace textbooks. Uh, in Washington state, it's local control, but still our books are seven to 10 years out of date. My state is tiny, big landmass, but tiny amount of people. We only have one million public school kids, and yet we spend $130 million a year on textbooks. So you would think for $130 million for a million kids, I get some pretty good stuff, right? Fact is, I don't. Here's what we get. And I've got two kids in public school, and so this pisses me off. I get a little angry when I go to PTA meetings about this. All right, so our books are seven to 10 years out of date. Is it okay that you're giving young minds educational resources that are seven to 10 years out of date? I mean, political science. When we were at the public hearing, one of the legislators said, uh, here's my daughter's political science textbook. The copyright date on it was 1998. Has anything happened in politics or you know, geopolitical anything since 1998? A few things, right? Uh, so this is unacceptable. Paper only. There's no digital anything. Kids have devices. A lot of them do. And yet, what do we give them? Paper. We tell them, you can't write in the book. We've got to keep the damn thing for a decade. Don't write in it. Don't put stickers on it. Don't do anything that could customize your learning resources. Uh, can you keep your books at the end of the year? I mean, welcome to 10th grade chemistry. Thanks for learning. Give me your books back, right? You can't have them anymore. That's what we tell students. What kind of stupid system is that? And then the teachers can't customize it, right? It's all rights reserved copyright. So even if they wanted to update that 1998 political science textbook, they can't do it. Even if they had the rights, it's all paper. How are you going to update it, right? So, so they work around it. And the last one here, and I'll try not to get too angry, but the school district makes me sign something. I send it home with my two boys every year that says, if your kids lose any of these paper textbooks, what do I have to do as a parent? I have to pay for them, right? And they're $150 per book because that's the replacement fee, right? And so I do my best to teach my boys, and part of it is teaching them the value of money. They know that $150 is more than they get in, you know, in a year or two in allowance and they don't want to be down $150. And so my kids refuse to take their textbooks between home and school because they think they might lose them. And when I try to put their textbooks in their backpack and tell them, it's OK, don't worry about it. Please take your learning resources to school, they cry. Right? This is the system that we've built around proprietary content when we don't share. We can do better than this. Now, Ohio State's doing some really fabulous work. Uh, we talked about this a little bit earlier. Let me show you a proper example uh, from uh, Gabe. So Gabe's got this. Is Gabe here today? Where's Gabe? There he is. Gabe doesn't know this. But Gabe's got this great uh, resource up here called Hacking the Thesis. He's got all this great information about how you work on your thesis. And I was reading this last night, and I thought, oh, I wish I had this when I was here. But if you go down to the very bottom, it says, Hacking the Thesis by Gabe Tippery is licensed under a Creative Commons Attribution Sharealike International License. And I say, huh, what does that mean? When I click on it, Gabe's linked out to the human readable deed of this license. And I say, gosh, I'm not a lawyer. Let me see what does this mean. And it says, you are free to share this resource, adapt it for any purpose, even commercially. Under the following terms, you must give attribution and, uh, and you must share alike as you make changes. And then I say, well, I don't speak, uh, I speak German as my first language, so I can come down here, translate it into German or French or whatever language. I want to read the legal rights that Gabe has extended to me. Thank you, Gabe. I now know that I'm not going to get sued if I take Gabe's work and I use it in the way that I want to, right? That's the difference between free and open. So wonderful work happening here as well. If the intent of all these great projects is to share them with the world, which clearly you're trying to share, you wouldn't put the stuff up on the web in the first place. Just remember, free's, free's free, but if you really want other people to be able to reuse something, put an, an open license on it as well. So here's another example. There's this, I ran across this great book called Plan for Opportunity, uh, sustainability plan for the Mississippi Gulf Coast, Coast past Katrina. And I said, wow, this is great. So I get into it, and I'm looking through it. 
Let me make this bigger. And I scroll down and it says the price is free. Free is good. And I'm looking and I'm looking and I'm like, where's the license? And there's no information, right? So if I'm at the University of Washington and I see this book and I want to use it, am I going to use this book? No, I don't want to get sued, right? And I, either I'm going to take the time to contact Jennifer Cowley and ask for special permission, or maybe I don't have time for that. But if Jennifer's intent is for this to go broad, all Jennifer has to do is, is stick an open license on that. Right? And then uh, really fabulous content going up in iTunes. I was talking with uh, your team yesterday, and they're actually going to make sure that all of this content that's coming out of the Digital First project in iTunes U will be under a Creative Commons attribution license. So thank you. Well done. That's, that's really great. Uh, we've, got, we've got something called the School of Open around all these things. So if you don't remember what I said, or you need a little more information, or you want to send somebody from your team or a faculty member to learn about open licensing or open educational resources, we've got this free school called the School of Open. Just type in School of Open on the web. It'll take you right to it. So let me shift now to policy. Uh, what, what do you do to incent people to actually start do this? So anybody remember Joe Brannan from the library? So Joe, unfortunately, recently uh, passed away. Joe was the head of the OSU library system. Wonderful man, and he taught me about open. And Joe was talking about open access one day, and I said, I, he was explaining all this. I said, Joe, I don't get it. And he says, he grabs me by the lapel, and he says, get over here. And he, show, he introduces me to a chemistry professor at Ohio State. And he says, tell Cable your story. And so this chemistry professor at Ohio State had, had done what he got to do for promotion and tenure, right? He was writing peer-reviewed journal articles. He had submitted it to an Elsevier journal, which is a commercial publishing house out of the Netherlands. And he had, in the process of submitting, had to turn over his copyright uh, because that's what journals ask you to do. You've got to give them your ownership. You don't own anything anymore. So even though this was a NSF-funded grant, so National Science Foundation, we all paid for it. And then Ohio State got this really big, fat grant, which was great. And this professor did the work. And he wrote the article, and he submitted it to the journal. And then Joe was in budget cuts at Ohio State Library time. Joe had to cut the journal that the guy had published in. And so the guy didn't have access to the journal to use it in his own class. And Joe said, and therefore, he, even though he got the grant, did the research, wrote the article, it's against the law for him to use his own article in his own course. Do you understand now the problem with the publishing system? And I said, yes, Joe, I do. Right? Because here's what Joe was talking about. He said, governments give out money, scientific research is done, articles are submitted, you got to turn over your copyright, everything's locked up, libraries subscribe to the journals, and not just Ohio State, but every library in the state of Ohio and community college and around the world subscribes to that journal, and it's very, very expensive. These journals can run north of $15,000 per year each. Right? Libraries are cutting them left and right. Harvard put out a press release last year that said, we can no longer afford the journals that we subscribe to. Harvard! How is Ohio State Library going to afford all these journals? Right? Public has very little reuse rights. The beauty, what Joe taught me, is all you got to do is change one thing. The very first part of the model, everything else stays the same. The first part of the model is an open policy. The government or the funder or the foundation, whoever's giving the money. And you talked about, I'm going to pick on you just a little bit. You talked about how you have grants and you give out grants and articles and stuff. All you have to do as a funder with your grant program is to say, if you take this money as a requirement of the grant, you share what you create. Right? It's an optional grant. You're not forcing this on anybody. But if you take this money, this NSF money or this NIH money, uh, you share what you build. So tactically speaking, what you do is you write in a Creative Commons attribution licensing requirement. If you take this money, you'll share what you build. The rest of it's the same. You still do the research. You still do the articles. You still submit to whatever journal you want. It's, and, and maybe there's an embargo period where you don't get access for a while. But then the public has access to what the public paid for. It's under an open license. And what do you get? Well, big surprise. People can actually read the research that you did. Big study came out a couple days ago that said, on average, less than three people read academic research articles when they're published. Right? Why is that? Well, it's because people don't have access. So here's the challenge of our day. This is what I ask you to think about. When the marginal cost of sharing is zero, what ethical and, and uh, professional and moral obligations do we have as educators and as staff who assist educators? How do we get the maximum return on investment for the public funds that are spent here at Ohio State University? And should we start to require open licensing 
on discretionary optional grants. I'm not talking about your base budgets. I'm not talking about forcing anybody to do anything. I'm talking about your optional grants. President Obama recently told his largest federal agencies, from now on, when you give out money for research grants, you will require that the articles are open access. The US Department of Labor a few years ago put out a $2 billion grant. That's billion with a B, as in boy, a lot of money. And they said, if you take this money, you will put a Creative Commons attribution license on what you build. These are academic programs that are being built. The grants are 20 million apiece. People are building programs in allied health, in green technologies, in advanced manufacturing, where there are jobs to put Americans back to work. And every single program that's being built will be under an open license. So whatever New York's building, you can use here at Ohio State. What, we're building aerospace programs in Washington State. It's all yours. Right? You don't have to ask permission, it's free, and it's got an open license on it so you can change it. We just worked with the California Community College Chancellor's Office. They move about $120 million a year through discretionary optional grants, and they said from now on, if you want money from us to do anything, you will put a Creative Commons attribution license on what you build, because publicly funded resources ought to be openly licensed resources. We're spinning up an open policy network right now to support these efforts, an institute of open leadership to train people around the world uh, on how to do this. But of course, this is not without its challenges. Uh, as you might guess, existing business models don't particularly like this conversation. When the $2 billion Department of Labor grant came out, they put this, they, this was the American Association of Publishers, uh, put this into congressional bill language in the House. And if you read this, it essentially says, uh, you may not get a grant from the Department of Labor uh, to build anything if it can be purchased from a commercial provider, or, and this is my favorite part, if they're thinking about building it, if it's under development. So I'm sorry, Ohio State, you really want to build that great new program to teach people about sustainability in marshlands. Uh, you can purchase that next year from a publisher that's considering building it. So this was a really dumb idea, and it was defeated. But the point is, is that uh, we are in the fight stage. So I was talking with Tom last night. Gandhi talked about four phases. First, they ignore you. Then they laugh at you. Then they fight. Then you win. We are in the fight stage. So if you choose to engage this topic, just know that this is not all peaches and cream, that there, is a, there are some rubs with existing models that don't particularly like this. Now, the important thing is to not play by the old rules. So for example, in Washington State with the Open Course Library, we said, we're changing the rules. The new rule is that textbooks in our classes don't cost more than $30. Okay, and we invited all the publishers in and we said, if you can play by those rules, we're your new best partners. And we're gonna put out million dollar RFPs to build content and we hope that you take that money and build stuff. But we're gonna hold the copyright and we're gonna put a Creative Commons attribution license on everything we build. And if you don't like those rules, you don't have to play. And if you try to get in our way, you don't want to do that because we've got uh, all the arguments on our side and we're on the right side of history on this one. One more quote here that I can't resist. There's a guy at Harvard named Eben Moglen, professor there, and he reminds us that when we openly license our work and leverage the internet as a free distribution channel, we put the creator, the author, and not the distributor in control of human knowledge. And his quote is, we make things and we give them away. Here, we made this. Would you like it? Take some, it's free. Right? And there's no retort to that, other than thank you, I suppose. So Churchill said, if you have knowledge, let others light their candles with it, right? And this was a riff off Jefferson. And this is the opportunity of our time. Will we leverage the technical and legal tools of the day to help everybody at Ohio State get a more affordable education and get access to the best content around the world? Will Ohio State fulfill its mission as a land-grant institution and share what it's producing to the maximum uh, degree possible, which is, which is part of what you do? And can we effectively use public funds to increase student success and access to educational resources? And here's the tricky part, can you hold all else in abeyance. Can you hold everything else, including existing business models, secondary to that primary goal?
Okay, and that's where, the, that's where the fight comes. So faculty, the ask of you is before you assign your textbooks for next semester, look at open textbooks, look at OER, look at putting together a course pack, look at OpenStax and other projects. And then what are you willing to share under an open license? College leadership, and there are several folks in the room, Look at your strategic plans. Where does open educational resources, where does open access fit in? Will you put an open policy requirement, a CC BY licensing requirement on your discretionary grants? How will you support faculty with time, money, innovation grants around these ideas? Make this an OSU-wide conversation. Get librarians, instructional designers, everybody else involved. Uh, work with MOOCs. Put an open license on your MOOCs and track the success. Uh, if you want to talk more about this, I'll be here in 2.20 at 2.30 at p.m. today. And if you like these ideas and want to work on this, my organization stands with you. And the final thought for the 21st century, the opposite of open is no longer closed. The opposite of open is broken. Thank you. Thank you so much, Cable. Um, we have about 10 minutes for questions. Uh, Cable obviously has a lot to say, fantastic, engaging keynote, so I thank him for that. Um, I'm going to remind everyone that a question is typically something we consider about two to three sentences long, ends with a question mark, so we're going to take as many of those as we can right now. And for those of you who want to have a more in-depth conversation, Cable will be available for one of the breakout sessions this afternoon. Um, if you have a question, please come on up to the mic. We're streaming, so we'd like to hear your voice when you ask your questions, and let's keep the conversation going for a few more minutes before we head out. there great great talk uh, I just want to know is uh, I, I know Lessig has been challenged in court has then been Creative Commons challenged legally and how what how what was the outcome of that yeah so great question um, yes uh, case I'll bring it up on the screen here so if you go to Google and just type in Creative Commons case law uh, we keep track every time a Creative Commons license goes to court every anywhere on the planet and as you can see, there aren't very many. That's it right there. Those are all the legal cases. Creative Commons licenses have been upheld every single time, and they've never lost once in court. And uh, the, one of the reasons why they don't go to court very often is these are written by the best IP attorneys on the planet, uh, by uh, uh, law school professors at Harvard, Stanford, Yale Law, University of Barcelona, I mean literally thousands of lawyers around the world. We just updated our licenses from version three to version four. And the re we did that for two main reasons. One is copyright law is always changing around the planet. Governments are changing the rules. And so our licenses adjust to make sure that they're always compliant with copyright law in every country on the planet. Because we need to make sure that when Ohio State puts a Creative Commons license on at work, that anybody else in the world can pick it up and, and they can legally use it. Second reason is that communities change. Educators around the world change their behaviors and practices. Scientists are using big data now, right? We were talking about big data last night at dinner. And so uh, one of the things that's happening is Europe is putting pouring money right now into big data research. And in Europe, they've got something called sui generis database rights, which we don't have in the United States. It's essentially the how you build a database, you can put copyright on that, you can own the structure. And so the Europeans said, look, Creative Commons, you've got to change your license so we can license those database rights because they're important to us in Europe. We said, OK. <laughs> and so we changed the licenses. No questions? Are you all converts now? <laughs> Join us. <laughs> oh, here, here the questions come. Now there's lots of them. Oh, I'm first. Go ahead. <laughs> um, well, first of all, in 10 years, uh, I, I think it's great to see how, you know, this content has just exploded, um, uh, and, and not only in terms of quality, but quanti quantity and quality. But anyway, I was curious um, what Creative Commons as an organization, what its stance is towards issues of online piracy, uh, ba basically practices that flout traditional copyright. Yeah, it's a good question. So cr Creative Commons works with copyright. Creative Commons is not an alternative uh, to copyright. So we say keep your copyright, be legal, and if your intent is to share, we give you tools to keep your copyright and share under the terms and conditions that you choose. So when it comes to uh, piracy, violating copyright, uh, we don't agree with that. Now that being said, we do agree that there is need for copyright reform. And if you go to our blog, you'll see that we just issued a big board approved copyright reform statement that basically says, look, copyright continues to get extended and it's primarily extended for commercial interests. 
So it, when copyright started in the United States, it was 14 years. Copyright now is death plus 70 years. And if you're a corporation, you can add more years to that. And so I don't know if, if you know your copyright history, but in 1978, Sonny Bono was in Congress and Mickey Mouse, Disney, right, was about to go into the public domain. And Disney didn't think Mickey Mouse going into the public domain was a good thing. And Disney, you know, handed some money. And not to say that anybody got bribed or took, you know, money and changed their vote in any way. Uh, but there was money that came from corporate entities and continues to, to extend copyright. So that's problematic. Uh, and this is what Larry Lessig's working on right now, is the corruption of money in politics. Uh, and the other, um, the other thing is that there are, there are fair use rights in the United States and other countries, they call them fair dealing rights. And those are exceptions to copyright. So the librarians in the room teach faculty about fair use rights. And so in some cases, you may see a all rights reserved copyright thing, and especially as an educator, um, you can still use that, that work for limited purposes without seeking permission. But fair use and fair dealing rights are fairly narrow and fairly limited. And so one of our stances at Creative Commons is that those should be broadened. There should be more fair use and fair dealing rights. Now, all that said, if you want to avoid those problems, it's very simple, right? Let copyright law be what it is, add a Creative Commons license to it, and you, and you clear all those hurdles out of the way, and you let people use it on the terms and conditions that you choose. Yeah. Are there resources available to teach our students about Creative Commons? Because it seems to me that the younger you start in K through 12 to get them to understand this, the better off we would all be. I know. Anybody from the College of Education in here? Good. So call me. I want to talk to you. Uh, one of the things that we're doing, so here's the School of Open that I mentioned. And I'll scroll down here. So we actually have right here, uh, Creative Commons for K-12 educators. So uh, this course is running right now. And uh, we're focusing on K-12 in a big way right now for exactly the reason you said. Um, what we learned, uh, not to pick on a particular organization, but I will, um, the Motion Picture Association of America recently contacted the California K-12 system and said, good news, we want to put new curriculum in your school systems that's all about how sharing is bad. And, uh, and the videos are, you know, my dad is a musician and when you share music, you're taking food off our table. And so sharing is bad. Please don't share digital content. And this is kind of the message. And we don't think that's the right message for kids. We actually think sharing is a good thing. Uh, but you should teach both sides of the issue, right? You know, yes, you should keep your ownership. And there's reasons and ways to make money off, off what you build, especially if you're an artist. Uh, but you should, if you want to share, and those are your intentions, here's tools to do that. So uh, we're actually working in uh, California uh, alongside, in a pleasant way, with the Motion Picture Association uh, to ensure the curriculum goes in. We also need uh, every law school in the world to have a uh, open licensing course because uh, the lawyers that are in power right now in any particular organization, they graduated in a time before Creative Commons existed. And so when they hit Creative Commons, they're like, what's this? Like, we don't know what this is. And a lot of times that's enough to stop legislation or to stop a policy at a university. So you need to have your lawyers involved. Uh, yeah, over here. If you want to keep a MOOC open, to whom do we go? What platforms do we use? Coursera is now actually requiring instructor contracts that cede all rights to materials to either the university or Coursera. Let's talk about that. So let me show you. So I got to bring up my Coursera folder here. And here's the Michigan example. So here's a, sorry to use a Michigan example. I know, bad form. <laughs> but Ohio State doesn't have an open example on Coursera, or I would use yours. So, so Michigan's got this course, Instructional Methods in Health Professionals. And yes, Michigan has those silly rules that you just said as well. And Michigan said, Coursera, not your call. We're the copyright holders. This is your platform. You're a set of tools for our content. The faculty at Michigan and the university are the copyright holders, not you, Coursera. And so what they did, if you scroll down, this is what you should always do, see if resources are open. If you scroll down to the bottom of the page here, let me blow this up. This is under a Creative Commons Attribution Share Alike License. And then Michigan said even further, they said, so hey, you want something? Take it. 
got an open license on it. That's the license we use. And then they went a step further and they said, if you want to download all the files for our course, because Coursera doesn't make that easy for you to do, we're going to set up another uh, version of this course on the Open Michigan site. And here's that same course with all the downloadable files also under an open license. And so, you know, that's how they're open. So I would say if you want to have an open MOOC on Coursera, just do it. Just put the Creative Commons license on the landing page of your course. You don't have to ask anybody's permission. No tool or platform has the right to tell you what to do with your ownership. You own it. It's your copyright. You make the decision whether you share or not. It's not their call. Great. Thank you. Thank you again, Kate.